the amount of tension that's produced by a single muscle fiber really depends on how many active cross-bridge cycles are formed, okay? And as I say cross-bridge cycles, you should be thinking about actin and myosin. How many actin and myosin interactions are, are formed in that muscle really is what dictates the strength of the contraction, the duration of the contraction, the velocity of the contraction, how fast that muscle can contract, okay? Now, <clears throat> the more cross-bridges that we form, the more force we will generate, the more tension we will generate. And the number of fibers that are actively contracting will also dictate that. Okay, that makes sense. If the more cross, the, uh, more cross bridges that are engaged generates more force, then the more fibers that are actively cross bridging will, again, get, generate or dictate how much force is being generated. Um, now, we cannot, okay, I'll talk about that later on. Okay, let's speak about the frequency of stimulation, the frequency of stimulation. So this is sort of the first factor that we can use to increase force, increase tension, and to uh, generate more force from that muscle. Now, there are two principles here with regard to the frequency of stimulation. And before I distinguish the two principles and talk about them some more, I want us to remember from unit one that an action potential cannot sum, right? They cannot combine. And so the way that the nervous system and muscle, the way that these excitable tissues communicate and increase stimulus is simply by firing more action potentials. That's going to become very relevant as we talk about TREP and summation, okay? Now, TREP is the principle that we'll study, that we'll look at first, right? And this is this idea that if you stimulate a muscle, again, the stimulus is nothing but an action potential fired from that motor neuron. If you stimulate a muscle, okay, we're looking here at tension, the amount of force produced uh, against time. The initial muscle contraction will generate a set amount of force, then it will completely relax, okay? So in between each of these contractions, the muscle completely relaxes. What does that mean? In terms of understanding excitation contraction coupling, what does completely relaxing mean with regard to calcium? It has to leave the cytoplasm, correct. So in order for the muscle to fully relax, it has to leave, all the calcium has to leave the cytoplasm. So the idea behind TREP is that even though we stimulate this muscle a second time, for some unknown reason, this muscle generates more force and more force until it gets to its peak force production, okay? Now, TREP is not fully understand, understood, and this is why it's not fully understood. Because the muscle relaxes in between each of these contractions, why is the next contraction stronger? Why is there more force generated in subsequent contractions until we get to that plateau, okay? So this is TREP. Again, we don't fully understand why TREP happens, but we know that it does. You stimulate a muscle, you let it fully relax, you stimulate it again. Again, the frequency here is what we're looking at, like more, a more action potential is being fired. And the next time you stimulate it, for some unknown reason, it generates more force. Okay, that is TREP. Let's look at summation. Now, summation is different. We can explain summation. We do know why it exists, okay? Let's mention what summation is. Now, summation is the ability for these contractions to sum, not the action potentials, the contractions, okay? So they're gonna sum together, and that basically means that the muscle is not fully relaxing in between contractions. This is the difference between TREP and summation. In between our contractions, we do not have full muscle relaxation. All the calcium does not leave the cytoplasm. And so that explains why the subsequent con uh, contraction is a little bit stronger, generates a little bit more force. Now let's talk about the basis of summation, why it happens. We know that an action potential is around one to two milliseconds. We know that a contraction can be for a long duration, duration of time, right? Anywhere from 10 to 150, 200 milliseconds. And so in the time that we have a single muscle contraction, we can have several action potentials being fired onto this muscle. And this is the basis of summation. So we fire one action potential, right? The muscle has not completed its contraction, that latent phase, the contraction, and then the relaxation phase, that has not completed, but then we can fire another action potential and another action potential, and those contractions can begin to overlap, and that's what we call summation, okay? 
So it's important to distinguish trap or trape, which is some people pronounce it. Oops. Okay, it's important to distinguish trap where there is full muscle relaxation in between from summation where we have overlapping of these uh, contractions. And so let's look at this sort of uh, timeline here of a single twitch to complete tetanus. Now in this scenario, again, we're comparing force to time. And a twitch is that single brief period of muscle contraction. We talked about a twitch. This can be at the level of the motor unit. This can be at the level of the muscle fiber. This can be at the level of the entire muscle. So if we start to frequently fire action potentials, we then get summation, okay? And as you can see here, there is not full relaxation in between these muscle contractions. And so what we're starting with is a cytoplasm that already has some calcium in it. We're not starting from scratch, we're not starting from zero, and that is the basis of summation. The muscle has not fully relaxed in between, so when we fire a subsequent action potential, we'll generate more force naturally, okay? Now this can, con this can continue to happen, and if you fire action potentials, again, even faster, you further increase the frequency, we get incomplete tetanus at first, which is unfused muscle contractions, and so we still see that slight dip in between these contractions because there is a bit of relaxation, not full relaxation, but some bit of relaxation happening here. And then eventually we'll get to complete tetanus where there's absolutely no relaxation in between. All the crossword cycles are maxed out. The cytoplasm is completely saturated with, uh, saturated with calcium. And so as we can see, there's absolutely no relaxation happening in between these contractions. They completely fuse. This is called complete tetanus or tetanic contractions, okay? So this is that uh, sequence of events from a single twitch. And basically what happens if we increase the frequency of firing action potentials to this muscle? All right, any questions on that bit? Any questions? So just to reinforce this here, the reason for summation is calcium increase in the cytosol, and that's because we haven't fully relaxed the muscle, and that translates to all the calcium has not left the cytoplasm. Now, eventually, we saturate the system. All the troponin has calcium bound to it. All the crossbridges are engaged, so all the actin uh, are being bound by myosin, and this approaches maximum tetanic contraction, right? Sustained contraction. This happens if you're lifting something very heavy for a long period of time. This is what your muscles are doing as you're holding that, that load for a long time. There's absolutely no relaxation in between. Your muscles are just consistently uh, generating that force, consistently contracting. Okay, another factor that we'll talk about. So the first factor was frequency, okay? How fast we fire action potentials. The second factor here is fiber diameter, right? When we say fiber diameter, how big are those muscle fibers? And basically the fiber diameter translates to how many sarcomeres are engaged, how many myofibrils, how many fascicles are in that muscle that are actively engaged. So force, genera force generating capacity is in the inherent ability of a muscle to generate force. So this is gonna differ for different muscles. Smaller muscles have a smaller force, genera force generating capacity Larger muscles have a larger force generating capacity, and that is determined by how many sarcomeres are in that muscle. And that translates to the muscle diameter. How big is that muscle? If we have more fascicles with more fibers, with more myofibrils, we're gonna have a bigger muscle than if we have less fascicles, less fibers, um, we're gonna have a smaller muscle, smaller diameter. And so this really dictates how many cross bridges are formed, right? If we have more sarcomeres, automatically we have more cross bridges, okay? Um, and then how many sarcomeres are in parallel also tell us more force, how much force, okay? So how many cross bridges in a single sarcomere and how many sarcomeres are in the muscle? Those two things will translate to more force. Um, we also wanna look at the number of thick and, thin, thick and thin filaments. This is constant, so we cannot change how many thick and thin filaments, how many actin myosin are on a single sarcomere. That's constant. What we can change is how many fibers, right? How many myofibers are in that muscle? How many myofibrils? And that's what we do when we bulk up muscle. So when you work out and your muscle gets bigger, 
you're not changing actin and myosin. That's constant. That's never going to change. What you can change is that you can add more fibers, you can add more uh, fascicles, and you can make that muscle bigger so you're generating more force. Okay. So the active, thin, and thick filaments on a single sarcomere is constant, but we can change the number of, sarco the, uh, number of myofibrils, the number of fibers, and the number of uh, um, fascicles. Okay, I hope that made sense. So the fiber diameter plays a big role in generating force. The fiber length also plays a really important role in how much force we generate. Now, muscle needs to be at this nice optimal length in order to generate the maximum amount of force for that specific muscle, okay? And this optimal length is the resting length of muscle. This is that perfect length where we can have the maximum amount of cross bridges. If we start, crossword cycling out here, we're not going to generate as much force, right? We're starting the sarcomere way stretched out. If we start crossword cycling way in here, again, we're not going to generate as much force because the sarcomere is too contracted. And so the optimal length is that nice in-between length where we generate the most force because we have the most crossword overlap or the most um, crossword cycling. Now in situ just means the way it is in the body. The muscles, the way they are in the body, are at optimal length. That's why they're stretched across the joint. That's why they have an insertion point and an origin, so that they can maintain that optimal length. If the muscle was contracted, when we try to shorten that muscle, again, we would not have that optimum amount of crossword cycling, so we would not generate the maximum amount of force with that muscle. Okay. Let's look at greater than optimal length and less than optimal length, right? These are the two conditions that we say um, will not generate as much force as this nice optimal length up here, okay? And so let's look at this graph that compares the amount of force, um, the percent of the maximum force versus the length of the sarcomere. So if we start the sarcomere off on this end, very contracted, the Z lines are very close together, okay? When we have crossword cycling, we're not going to have the maximum amount of interaction, right? Because we're starting with this already so shrunken in. We're not going to have the maximum amount of crossword cycling. Likewise, if we start off, at, start off at a greater length than optimal length, we're starting the sarcomere very stretched out. Again, that is not the optimal length to give us the maximum amount of actin and myosin interaction, okay? So we'd like to be right around here. This is our optimal length. And as we can see, at this length, when the sarcomere is right in this sort of middle range, we generate the most amount of force in terms of the percent of our maximum force generation. So this is where muscles like to be, and this is why they are suspended in the body. They have a point of origin and a point of insertion to keep them at that nice optimal length. 